Welcome to Ticking Gray Bomb, Refined Taste for Idiots. I'm Mace, and I'm here with Max. And what up, what up? Uh, in the early 1990s, Lexus rolled out their certified pre-owned uh, program. And many of us scoffed, thinking this is just packaging up um, the word used, um, polishing up a turd, putting lipstick on a pig. Rolex has just announced their own certified pre-owned program. First, let's do our wrist check. All right, Max, what do you got on? Yeah, so this is the Seiko SPB071. It's a paddy diver. It's kind of like the 62 Moss. Um, I don't know if it's 62 MAS or 62 Moss. I've never heard it pronounced. It's kind of a, a desirable piece in the Seiko collection. I bought this from Noman in, in Singapore. If I'm not mistaken, it is a, a JDM, a Japanese domestic model. Really love this watch. I, I like the look. It's a it's it's a compact look, but the gradient dial, and again, we'll we'll link to a picture um, here so you can see that gradient dial. It really makes it, uh, gives it a nice kind of aesthetic look. Mace, what are you wearing today? So I got my flight master back from service. Um, been rocking it quite a bit. Um, and I got this sort of uh, racing leather strap from O2, O2 Straps. Um it was really cool. They sent an extra strap for me to test out. Um, no strings attached, uh, aside from asking me to post a picture. And he he would do this for any customer. It's dead. It, it's not because we have this fledgling uh, YouTube channel. Because um, of all your influencing capabilities. Right. I've bought a few straps from him. He's got um, some sailcloth straps that are pretty nice. Um, once again, that's O2 straps on Instagram. Um, good dude. I think, I think the strap really pulls out the seventies vibe, um, of this flight master. So I'm, I'm rocking it, uh, pretty consistency of, since the last week and a half, two weeks that I've had it back from service. This is the watch that, uh, I complained about <laughs> in our last, um, in our last episode where we talked about auction fails. So glad to have it back. It's in good shape. It works. Um, and really happy that uh, John Zangler um, in Limbrook, New York, was able to service it and put it back together. So that's what I got rocking. No, it's looking good. I like I like that combo, Mace. I mean, it's the case is so big, right? Um, that it could help with that kind of a sporty leather fit to kind of lighten it up a little bit. So I think that's a great combo. Yeah, and just you know, it is a it is a long lug to lug. Yes, so to speak, it's, it doesn't have traditional lugs. Um, you were kind of talking about, but you can see hopefully where the straps are kind of coming out of. So, because of where like you space, would, sorry, it's like Space Invaders, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're dating uh, ourselves. And so, where you can, um, where you attach the strap is a, is a few millimeters into um, the case design. So it doesn't it doesn't protrude quite that bit or or feel yeah no it's nice you got wrist. you got a tight fist fit to the wrist which I think is great um, no I think it's a really good look I mean it's it's a uh, it's an iconic case um, but you know it's bulky nonetheless right it's kind of like the hooded wolf right you got that big <laughs> shroud um, of a case right so uh, I think it's a great it's a great uh, creative touch on your part all right so. Let's talk about kind of the last couple of years. What's going on with uh, with Rolex? Kind of set up this conversation around the the certified pre owned program. As we all know, um, watch prices have gone up, particularly those model those brands like Rolex, AP, um, have exploded uh, during the COVID era. Um, and you know the gray market has been prominently involved. That's probably the only place that you can get a Rolex these days if you're if you want to get one the ADs don't have them and about a year ago in November of 2021 I went into an AD and their Rolex case was empty with the exception of a very small uh ladies you know D-just right um two tone that was it I would and you know, jump in here if you've had experience at the 80s. Um, I know in the spring, um, I went to a couple of um, places more locally. I'm in lower Connecticut and went in and they had exhibition only 
uh, models, right? You could you could try them on. Um, there was speculation, or one of the gentlemen at the, at the AD told me that they really have dummy movements in them. They're just really for fit to try them on. Um, then in November of this year, I went to the same place um, that I went to a year ago, and they had exhibition models. And um, the salesperson there told me that they're actually fully functioning watches. Um, and when you ask them why they have them there, um, the rationale didn't make a ton of sense, but it was Rolex wanted to, didn't want any empty cases. Um, they wanted to have some watches that the people could touch and feel. Um, I suspect in some way, this is Rolex giving the AD a bone by at least having something in the, in the case to draw traffic in. Anyone who's been into any Rolex AD anywhere in the world would have experienced that same thing. Okay. Um, and we see this on, on Watch You Seek. We see this on, you know, all the websites, um, people complaining about the lack of availability of new Rolexes, right? And how, I think the, the, the other layer here, Mace, is how the ADs are behaving once they do get deliveries, right? So you and I don't have access to that, to walking in off the street as we might have maybe four or five years ago. Um, because I could say even in 2019, pre-COVID, um, I was hunting certain Rolex pieces and it was hard to find them. Okay. So I, I, the only thing I would add is A, um, right, this is not strictly a COVID phenomenon, but B, more importantly, it's, it's really resulted in a change of behavior at the AD level to really not even pay attention to, uh, to people like you or I coming off the street, but really focusing either on, and I think this is important for the future, the conversation we're going to have later, it, it, either the, the people who have an absurd amount of money to spend and they really want Rolex, so how do they build up into some of these hype pieces? And two, how they treat their customers, right? Their, their established customers, right? Because you and I don't fit in that group, right? And most right. of, let's say most of watch enthusiasts don't fit in that group, right? So how has that behavior, you know, I think we could talk about how that behavior has fueled the secondary market activity, right? right. For Rolex over the last two to three years. Rolex comes out with their certified pre-owned program rolled it out in Switzerland, right? You can take a look at the pricing there. We'll, we'll get to that. And then they're going to more broadly roll it out in uh, early spring, 2023. So with that as the backdrop, I'm going to start peppering Max with some questions. You know, what do you think the Rolex got into this pre-owned market? Is it as simple as getting a piece of the gray market? So here's what I think, okay? Um, I look at this as... You know, the, so, you know, Mesa said this, we're in the New York City area. Um, and as you could probably tell from our intro, I'm a Yankees fan. And the Yankees also did something similar, right? And, and most, most sport, sports teams have, have tapped into dynamic pricing, okay? Because they're realizing that there's a giant pie here um, in terms of sports spend that they really only get a, a, a fraction of, Okay. And I think this is the this is the 21st century question, business intelligence question for a lot of companies is how can we leverage data to take advantage of that, right? So in the watch market, it's no you know um, it's no surprise, right, that there's a lot of money flowing in here that is structurally uh, you know increased dramatically during COVID. Um, Adrian Barker made an interesting observation. Um, he quoted. Um, uh, you know, I can't remember which consultancy, but as as sizing this the 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 secondary watch market as a twenty billion Swiss franc market, that's enormous, right? Um, when you think about these little, I mean, these little devices that go on people's wrists, basically just to tell the time. Okay, so so I'm sure anyone out there, um, not just Rolex, AP, uh, maybe even Patek, but others are saying. How do we get a bigger share of this, okay? Because it's valued not in pieces, okay, but in dollars, right? And so, or, or Swiss francs in this case. So how can we get a bigger piece of that? So I think, Mace, 100%, the, 
they're trying, Rolex is definitely trying to uh, to extract a bigger share of the pie when it comes to the secondary market. Now, it could also be, and I, I'll insert this and then we can take a step back, we can talk about it a little later. It could also be another kind of marketing phenomenon as customer lifetime value. And it could be a way, and I guess, you know, Adrian Barker also investigates this, explores this a little bit. It could be a way to make Rolex purchases stickier over the lifetime of a customer, okay? And you really, you can straight line it into an, an evolution um, where a lot of watch brands, I don't think have a good grasp of what their customer profile looks like and how to get their customers into bigger pieces, bigger spend. How do you think this impacts the gray, gray market, the gray, uh, those dealers that deal in these kind of secondhand pieces? So Mace, I mean, you know, when, when the idea dropped, right, when the, this news dropped, I think a lot of folks expected this would be really a, a foot on the throat of gray market dealers, really snuffing out. Um, a lot of these folks were trying to make some, you know, some money here. Now, I think, you know, again, a, a lot of folks on YouTube, you know, a lot of folks who probably, you know, who have definitely been doing this longer than us and have a broader view of, 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 of watch topics than we do, um, you know, have made comments that, hey, look, at the end of the day, it's not the gray market dealers who are making tons of money, right? They're still flipping watches for, you know, maybe a few hundred bucks, maybe a thousand dollars. So, yeah, I mean, the people who've extracted the lion's share of this, right, are not the gray market dealers, but rather they're the flippers, right? I mean, they're the people who are sourcing the watches at the AD level and then selling them for market rate to a gray dealer, right? And other folks, you know, in the market have, have commented on how Rolex really needs to get a handle on their ADs to try to stop this process. Um, I'm sure Rolex has tried. Um, and I'm sure the ADs have tried to police this, okay? But this could be Rolex's way of saying, we understand this is a problem and we can't stop that, but here's how we are gonna respond. Have you checked out the initial pricing of the watches under this certified pre-owned program? So, yes, yes. And, you know, Again, initial feedback, initial third-party feedback is like, holy crap, these are <laughs> elevated prices, right? Um, so I'll give you, I, I have a couple of, of deals here, right? Um, I looked at I looked at several pieces and I, I, you know, Tourneau is a reference point that I use, right? Tourneau is a, is a, a, is a big US-based AD, actually they're based here in New York. Um, they, they were recently purchased by Bucherer Okay, and Booker, you know, again, I know them as a watchmaker, but they're a giant retailer and and Rolex authorized distributor. So yeah, Torno is a credible right source. They rolled out their own certified pre-owned program several years ago. Um, so basically, what I've checked is I checked Booker's Rolex certified pre-owned site. I checked Torno's site um, for certified pre-owned outside the Rolex program. And I checked Chrono, right? To kind of line out these, these costs. I wanted to highlight three to four pieces that, that I thought were of note, okay? Um, the first piece is the, uh, is the Rolex Batman, okay? Very popular piece, obviously, right? The, I think it's a 126710BRL. Uh, Bucherer, Rolex certified pre-owned, they're asking, 21,000 Swiss francs. That's exorbitant, right? That's a giant number. Um, Tourneau, again, certified pre-owned, 18,000 US, okay? Which is still a hefty number, but this is a high piece, right? And then when we go to, uh, when we go to Chrono, I mean, you could probably pick up a, 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 some, a, a, one of these Batman in the US, oyster bracelet for about 15. And so you'd say, okay, between 15 and 17, 15 and 18, is there value to know that this is a real watch, this is good? Maybe, but when you talk about 21K Swiss francs, which you know now is probably, you know, I mean, is, is an excess of that in US dollars, how much value is there, 
right? So that's the first piece. The second piece I looked at was the Blue Z. It's the 116613. Obviously, um, that's that's a, a, a piece that's known to us. Mace's brother has a nice Blue Z ceramic, ceramic bezel. This is not so much a, a, I wouldn't say this is a hype piece, but this caught my eye. Interesting, there's a, there's a flip in the, in the dynamics here. Um, Bucher pre-owned, Rode, Rolex pre-owned 18,000 for Swiss, Swiss francs. Tourneau has a bluesy for 23 grand. Big number. Mm. Okay. Um, and then on Chrono, you could probably pick one up. Cheapest in the U.S. was about 16 grand. Okay. So kind of interesting dynamic there. Tourneau, from my experience, is already the top end of the market. Right? It's not even the top 80%, right? They're going to be in the top 98%, okay? Uh, because they're looking to extract maximum value because they're giving you the assurance of something that's, that's real, right? And that will work. And you can tell from our auction fail uh, video that we buy a lot of people like us, a lot of kind of collectors or amateurs um, uh, buy pieces from people that often don't work. Right. And either we have to return them and we're sad um, or we have to repair them out of our pocket, which makes us a little frustrated. Right. And increases the investment in that timepiece. So that's clearly what what Rolex or rather that that's what Torneau was trying to capitalize on. I think another element of what Rolex is trying to cap capitalize on is the assurance that this is real, that these are real Rolex parts that go into servicing this watch. Right. Because. That's the other side of the Rolex, right? I mean, it's, uh, and Mace, you and I talk about this a lot. This is my, this is kind of centers on my Rolex 8, if you will. But, um, you know, when we talk about luxury items or luxury watches, you know, you want to feel that something that's somewhat rare, someone's limited. And, you know, essentially the market is flooded with Rolexes, at least used Rolexes. Um, and there, it's easy to insert fakes into that pool um, and it's hard to track that, right? So you and I can fall victim to that. You know, this is also a positive element of the program where you know you're getting a real Rolex. Now, is it worth paying a, you know, a seven to $8,000 premium for that? I mean, we can let our viewers decide. Um, I certainly think that's, that's a bit rich. Is that, you know, guarantee that certification worth that extra premium. It's a question you got to ask yourself, right? And I think people who are following this are probably less likely to think that's worth the extra, right? If you're kind of, you know, if you're a watch enthusiast, probably less likely. If you're buying it for, um, it's your first Rolex, you're buying it for a significant event in your life, maybe that is... Um, someone who would really want to get it at an AD. Um, it might be confusing to them, right? Why is this used model, you know, 40% more than the brand new one in the in the case that I can't buy? Right. But that I think that that might be some of the some of the population who might be interested in in getting that that guarantee. So given the pricing of the certified pre-owned pieces that that we've talked about and we've seen kind of already on the web, do you think this will impact gray market pricing? I mean, I think this is a great question, Mason. Everyone's talked about this. Does this, you know, does this squelch gray market activity? And look, I mean, I think there's a, this creates a much, in a way, this creates a much clearer space for gray market players. Right. Um, now, maybe, you know, it actually gives them because there's so much room here. Right. There's, we, we, we were really surprised to see, you know, again, in the case of the in the case of the, the Batman, you know, is there, uh, you know, is there two to three thousand dollars of room? Um, you know, maybe more. Mason, in a way, I would say this creates an interesting kind of middle space. Right. For for gray market dealers um, because, you know, you look at that in the case of the Batman, you look at that, let's say two to $3,000 um, difference between where the gray market is for a Batman, let's say 15, 16 K and where Rolex or where the Rolex certified pre-owned Batman would be in around 21 grand. 
Um, does that create a space for the gray market to say, hey, look, I'm going to put a little another bell whistle here to try to give you a little bit of certainty, but you can still get this for five thousand dollars less than you can get at Booker. Right. Right. So I, I don't I don't think it, it's going to kill gray market activity based on what we saw over the last week. What do you think, Mace? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm in the same boat. Right. I, I was expecting it to be more in line. Um, maybe it sort of, you know, we know that Rolex prices have come down in the secondary market a bit. I thought they might be at kind of the, the top end of the more def deflated market, but their, their pricing almost seems like it's from, I don't know, the high end of the market six months ago or, you know, something like that. So really kind of surprised there. And I think the gray market dealers will kind of continue to operate really unfazed at least in the short term so yeah. and i think that leads us to the next question which is how successful do you think rolex will be with these pieces that are under the certified pre-owned program yeah i mean i, I you know when, when i think about your comment to, to the last question mace it really depends on what the availability of rolexes are, is going to be new rolexes is going to be right um everything both rolexes pow pricing power and the gray market dealer pricing power depends on availability, right? We know, you know, kind of piggybacking off my comment uh, earlier, right? We know there's tons of availability of used Rolexes, right? Of secondhand Rolexes. Um, we know there's almost no availability or allegedly, you know, our perception is there's no availability of new pieces, okay? Um, so all this happens, you know, all this is developing in that context. If that changes, um, and I don't think anything's going to change to the excessive availability of used Rolexes um, because they're there. I don't think anyone's going to start buying them up and hoarding them. Um, so really the variable is, will, it, will the availability of new Rolexes change, improve? Okay. And I think that's really um, the pivotal piece. Um, I don't see, you know, to be honest, I mean, look, we're looking at this through our lens, right? The lens of a, of a, of a, a watch enthusiast, of a collector, et cetera. Um, I don't see this being a great success at these levels, right? Um, but I guess it's, I mean, it, it maybe for Rolex, it's better to start high and kind of drift down than it is to start low and try to punch up. Um, from a perception standpoint, I don't know. I mean, I think there, there, there are certainly pros and cons to both approach, both approaches. Yeah, we'll just have to see what happens here. Let's say Rolex is not as successful as they had hoped. People are not really jumping at the opportunity to get this uh, certification. How quickly do you think they'll react and adjust their pricing? It's anyone's guess, Mace. I mean, that's a great, that's a great question, right? I mean, I, what I was thinking so. You know, Timeless Watch Channel, right? Uh, um, Oshon O'Malley had a great point. Right? His 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 approach to this was, you know what? Just buy it cheapest, you know, as cheap as possible from a secondary market dealer, from a gray market dealer, and then bring it to Rolex for service. And I say, fair, good point, well played. Okay, right. but the thought that popped into my mind, especially the way we know how Rolex behaves, is if Rolex sees an inflow, a dramatic inflow in service requests, that could change the variable too, right? I mean, that could that could force Rolex to, to increase prices of service, right? Which is just a kick in the nuts for your average Rolex customer, right? You know, I, roll, I own a Rolex every five to seven years, I'm gonna have to get it serviced, right? Um, now, now I have to pay a lot more for that too. Right. Right? And I think about, and that happens because I think about that, um, you know, in the case of, for example, Patek, Right now, obviously, Patek also super hype watch. Um, there was so much activity and interest in in older Pateks that their archive office was getting bombarded, was getting overwhelmed by requests for you know the extract, and they triple the price. So this stuff happens. This will happen, and ultimately, it will. You know, if that plays out the way one might expect, um, that will just penalize your average Rolex owner, right? 
Right. And I guess there was speculation, you know, piggybacking off what you just said, the availability of parts, right, for servicing, right? Will they make them as widely available if they're, you know, to other watchmakers, right? If they're doing a lot of these services, right? And then that, that, right, that, that makes those watchmakers unable to service it, right? And it kind of increases flow to, so the Rolex, uh, Rolex went, right, and so that that could be an issue. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, these are all. I mean, I, we're not saying that this these scenarios are going to happen, but these are things to to you know wh where these are unintended consequences of 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 strategies like this, right? Potential unintended consequences. So we alluded to Adrian Barker's video on this, and he made an interesting comparison to the high end automotive market, right? where a dealership would require um, an individual to buy uh, maybe not the car of their dreams that they really want, but a lesser model, have that car for a few years. And when their preferred model, their dream model comes available, they'll go back to the dealership, turn in their car and be able to get their dream car. Right. And so he compared this Rolex certified pre-owned program to that. And so, yeah, so this concept of stickiness, you see this with companies trying to target their their customers. Um, it's prevalent in, in in banking, right? You they want you to set up your your accounts, right? Your checking account, your savings account, right? You they want you to enroll into the automatic deposit of your paycheck. They make you offers about CDs, right? And credit cards. Credit cards. They want you to get your mortgage through them, right? They do all of these things because they know it's harder to disengage from that relationship if you have to unwind three, four, five different products and it's a big hassle and they don't want you to do that, right? So in some way, and Max referenced this before, right? It's almost this this chain of events. You go out and you buy a watch, you know, maybe you didn't have your heart set on, but if that helps you bridge the gap to the watch that you really want, or at least trade up, right? And then in a couple of years, we'll just buy that back from you, and then you can get another watch that you really wanted. And, you know, here's the thing. We, there's, the ADs don't really promise anything, right? There's this understanding that you have to buy a lot of jewelry. You have to buy a lot of non-Rolex product, right? You have to buy the slower moving inventory, right? In order to get a hope for one of those hype pieces. And this is where perhaps the ADs can be helped, but also hurt, right? Because they're using, they're leverage, trying to leverage Rolex as part of their overall strategy um, to run their business. And maybe this, this creates a little bit more of a tighter uh, trajectory for customer spend around only Rolex, right? right. Um, but you can get for the customer, you might get a, again, it's, it, we're following Adrian's hypothesis, but if you can get a guarantee from Rolex that just like you got, you know, from Ford about your Bronco, that you will get this car. It's just a question of when. OK. Um, and the Rolex demand is so strong right now where that could have value for a lot of customers. All right. Well, I think we've talked about this uh, certified pre-owned program um, ad nauseum. But I will give Max one last chance to, uh, to grace us with his final commentary or uh, any last thoughts about this. No, I mean, look, I think this is real. I mean, certainly this is a bomb. This is one of the biggest bombs that was dropped on the watch industry in 2022. Um, yeah, big, big, very much a ticking gray bomb. Okay. Uh, and where I think both of us and many others, right, are very interested to see how this evolves. So um, leave comments. Would love to see your hypotheses in terms of where this is going to go. Does it have a chance to be successful? Is it going to fall on its face? Because I have a feeling that us and others are going to be tracking this over the next year or so to see how, how it's turning out. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.